Welcome. This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. I am very pleased to present uh, Judge Charlotte Woolard, Judge Paul Beeman, and Mark Lahaki uh, speaking today on strategy, civility, ethics, and sanity in an uncivil time, mapping an effective settlement strategy that incorporates ethical rules and the brain science. Katie, thank you. And uh, to kick things off, I am Mark Lahaki. Uh, with me on screen is Judge Paul Beeman and Judge Charlotte Walter Willard. We'll each do some self-introductions in a moment or two. Um, but to just kick things off, initially we want to, all three of us want to thank ADR Services for sponsoring this event. Um, and we want to thank all of you for participating, particularly on what is a historic day. Um, not, not all history is good, but a historic day. Um, we have, I think, 463 folks signed in. Thank you. Thank you for watching us and taping the other thing, as opposed to the other way around. Um, as mentioned, uh, we do have this set up, so we are inviting questions throughout. We may take some questions later. We may take some in real time as we go forward, but please, as we are proceeding, jump in. Um, but before we get in even into the outline, I think, I think we need a bit of whimsy to kick things off. So I am going to try with my limited skill set to, oh, Katie, I may need your help. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So let me, let <laughs> me see. Mark. Bear with me, everyone. Sorry about that, Mark. That's Go okay. Ahead. We'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. All right. So let's see if we can do the share screen thing. Hold on, everybody. We'll get there. Wasn't there a song like that? <laughs> There's, there should be. All right. Now I'm hoping in a moment here, you'll be able to see what I see. Is that working? May I ask Charlotte, uh, Paul? Yes. All right. Yes. Good. Good. All right. So courtesy of Judge Beeman, as we all know, when we take ethics courses, we do it for the most important social reason and because it's for the greater good and also because we're required to. So a la Dilbert, um, you, as you can see, the characters are talking to each other. You're all required to complete a class in ethics. Wouldn't that make us the only ethical organization in our industry and create a competitive disadvantage that leads to our demise? Stop your worrying, the class is required, but I'm not expecting any of it to stick. We're hoping some of this sticks. So again, bear with me as we move through these. The good news is we're going to spend a little bit of time on slides and then we're gonna go forward to a, a conversation as soon as I realize how I can do this. All right, come on folks here. All right, so again, we'll do introductions in just a moment, but just to set the stage for our conversation today, we have two hours and we're gonna, we're gonna cover a number of topics and we're gonna explain how they interrelate starting with a brief uh, reference to some of the civility and ethics rules for California lawyers. Uh, you will see a more expanded list of those rules and even that expanded list is just scratching the surface of what is out there by way of rules that apply to us all. We'll then talk about the courts weighing in, meeting some selected cases. There are many more, but some very interesting cases in the last few years. Um, that reaffirm some of the, uh, the key principles that we're talking about. We'll address the question of whether standards have changed or whether people perceive standards have changed because unfortunately a few do. Um, and in turn, whether we have. Um, and then that is, that is basically part A of our program. Part B then will be without screens and slides, uh, an opportunity to talk about the practical issues of applying the rules and applying another topic, 
which is the brain science. And as you'll see, we'll spend a few minutes talking about some of some fascinating brain science research that has to do with how we all perceive things and how it relates to the issue of ethics and civility and doing the best job we can in the course of trying to get disputes resolved. So let me go forward here. So our, our illustrious panel, we're, we've decided to let folks um, provide some self-explanation. Self and, and as you see, we have two judges on our panel. And part of what I'm hoping from Judge Beeman and Judge Willard is um, some background about what you were doing before you were on the bench, what you were doing on the bench, and, and obviously what you've been doing since. So Judge Willard, do you care to start out? Sure, thanks, Mark. Uh, I spent uh, approximately 22 years on the bench and almost 20 of them were with the San Francisco Superior Court. And about half of that time was spent in family law, which ended up being my favorite assignment. Um, I started my career as a research attorney for the Superior Court and then went into the DA's office in San Francisco and then on to um, an international a civil firm where I was a civil litigator. And uh, I've been with ADR services since 2015 when I retired from the bench and I serve as an arbitrator, judge pro tem, mediator and discovery referee. Half of my caseload is family law cases. And the other half uh, is business disputes, contracts, professional malpractice, personal injury, real estate and landlord tenant cases. So again, thank you all for attending this. Um, I think we're all going to learn quite a bit. I know I did as I was preparing for the presentation. Thank you, Judge Willard. Judge Beeman? Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, uh, I graduated from McGeorge in 73, started practice that December with a small firm in Vallejo and uh, did just about whatever came in the front door, at least tried to. And a lot of criminal work uh, in the beginning. But after about five or six years, I tapered that off and uh, focused almost exclusively on personal injury work. I was in private practice for over 26 years. And then I was appointed to the bench in uh, May of 2000. I um, retired in uh, I retired March of 2018. I was in a direct calendaring civil uh, department for 12 years. I was a PJ for two years and the others were uh, adult felonies and uh, juvenile court. Um, I've been with ADR, I think since April or May of uh, 2018. And I've uh, done a wide variety of work. I, uh, I enjoy it. Uh, cases come in that I'm not tremendously familiar with some, and then you have to come up to speed and get familiar with them. And uh, I've enjoyed that a lot. So uh, that's about all I have to say. Well, we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Judge Beeman. And uh, again, I'm Mark Lahaki. I have a different path to ADR. I was a litigation attorney for roughly 20 years. Uh, handling antitrust, intellectual property, business torts primarily. And uh, roughly 18, 18 years in was asked by a um, uh, retired judge, Wayne Brazil, the federal court here in San Francisco to do some volunteer uh, mediation work. And frankly had no other plans at that time other than to be a good citizen and do some pro bono work. Um, I then after a couple of years, was of doing the volunteer work and continuing to litigate what became a general counsel for different companies, starting at Dryer's Ice Cream in Oakland, California, uh, became part of Nestle, the worldwide food company, and then finished up at the Ross Dress for Less chain, um, something I was not allowed to tell anybody, so I didn't embarrass one of my teenage daughters at the time, but time's passed, so I can mention it. Um, but throughout the uh, litigation days, those later litigation days, my general counsel work, I continued to do volunteer mediation work. More importantly, started to use mediation much more, I would say, thoughtfully in terms of trying to sort out disputes sooner and became a true believer in its potential. And then roughly eight or nine years ago, I um, 
shut down all those other activities just to work in the ADR field and continue to work in areas such as class actions, large, uh, large uh, intellectual property cases, as well as individual employment disputes and uh, other interesting things that get presented. Um, we'll talk about, I think, how all of our expert prior experiences shape what we're going to talk about later, uh, later in the program about how it all fits together. But for now, we'd like to just again go over a little bit of overview. Um, we call this part A, this is the slideshow part. We're going to talk about some of the applicable rules and decisions, but really lean more in the latter half of the program to putting it all together. And before we get there, also talk about the, the interesting overlay of some of the brain science and, and how it applies. So with that background and remembering, we invite questions um, along the way and uh, if we don't address them along the way, we will try to get to them in the second half. But let's jump forward because we um, have a lot to talk about. Again, the, the marketing material, the marketing, the handout materials that you should have seen PDF version list a portion of the uh, the ethics and civility rules that govern us practicing in California. I will confess, I was one of the people that did not know there was a civility oath until I was invited to be on one of these panels a few years ago with Judge Beeman and realized, oh, there's a civility oath that came into effect in 2014. Um, Query, why do we need to have a civility oath? I think we'll, we'll get to that as we go forward. And there are, other, there are other highlighted rules here, but again, rather than repeat them, they're in the materials. Um, I think Judge Beeman, you were also had an interesting comment we were preparing about the wealth of information that's out there for people that would like to get better information about um, this topic. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, there's, as I got looking into what I, uh, agreed to do here this morning. Um, you look at, there's like eight chapters uh, with the uh, code, the current rules of professional conduct. I'm not gonna read all eight chapters to you, but uh, chapter one, I printed out and it's actually, it's 43 pages. Uh, it's got 18 rules and a lot of comments and it's really quite interesting. I mean, it's easy enough to say that all this stuff is boring, dull, and you've got better things to do. But when you sit down and you start spending some time on it, you really, I mean, I personally uh, really did learn in preparation for this program. Uh, I don't know if I'm supposed to make that kind of admission, but it's true. <laughs> uh, the, and I would just want to give you a sample uh, for, they have a, a chapter called Advocates. And it talks about, they've got like uh, 10 sections in there. And I'll just read the first five. Uh, meritorious claims and contentions, delay of litigation, candor towards the tribunal, fairness to opposing party and counsel, uh, contact with judges, officials, employees, and jurors. It goes on. I mean, they're just really a wealth of information in there. I mean, I'm sure everybody strongly believes they know the difference between right and wrong. Let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff in the rules that you don't think of. And if you, it's kind of like the old adage, you know, being forewarned is forearmed. But Mark was talking about different sources. There are a plethora of sources. One that was kind of most people don't pay attention to, the California State, State Supreme Court has a committee on ethics and they issue opinions. Judges, presiding judges, they can submit uh, problems or questions to the court and they answer it. And the answers are just, I mean, they're rich. They're really nice to read. But I mean, I'm sure you folks are probably, almost all of you are members of the California litigation section or the California Lawyers Association. I mean, the publications they put out and it's kind of like show and tell, uh, but I mean, they, they, they put it out. All you have to do is look. And there's a ton of stuff. You can go online. Uh, you look in the Daily Journal. You can see who's been disciplined recently by the bar. Read what they did wrong and hope that your name's not in there. But, I mean, there's just an awful lot of sources once you take the time and, and look. And trust me, uh, much of it you will enjoy. So I'll stop there. I appreciate that. And you'll see, by the way, it's it part of the handout materials at the end, we we 
pulled together some very interesting materials, not just on the state of the rules and some case law citations, but some really interesting reading material. And we recommend, uh, take a look at it. There, there's some great stuff there. Um, by the way, as we're seeing the Q&A, some, some, um, some of our attendees have asked whether all of the attendees are on the web um, screen as well. And just to let you know, we're, this is set up as a webinar format. So fortunately or unfortunately, you just see us and Katie um, uh, rather than we see the whole group. Um, so um, so you, no, one, if you, you, no one has to change their clothes at the last minute. So, so let's go forward. And as I, we said, we um, first half here, we're going to talk a little bit about cases and then we're going to integrate the legal principles later on. So there are a number of recent cases. We just quickly pulled together some, a few of the ones that seem to really resonate, touching on some different factual situations and some, and some different um, ethical and civility issues. Um, so Judge Beeman and Judge Willard agreed to divide up sort of the, the overview of them. Um, and we'll do that for the next several minutes before we, before we shift gears a little bit. So I think in order, uh, Judge Beeman, were you going to address Lossing as, as a, to start it off? Yes. I didn't realize we're jumping forward in our schedule so quickly, but uh, I'm ready for it. Oh, yeah. uh, and let me, let me back up a second. One of these rules that you'll, I think you'll hear us addressing, and it'll be kind of a theme as we go along here. Uh, if you haven't printed up the materials, you should. You should take a, a ch chance and look at it. But the, this, the communications with your client, it's a good idea you communicate with your client. Uh, and in particular, you know, the rules talk about um, keeping them informed because you, you, they need to have informed consent. They need to what's going, what's going on in their case. In particular, I'm talking about rule uh, 1.4 uh, B and uh, I won't read it to you, but it's, it's very important and it underlies a lot of this. Now as to the case you wanted me to talk about, the first one is, uh, I pronounce it lossing. And um, since I think most of you folks don't have the materials, I'm gonna read what's this one sentence and then make a couple comments. Lawyers and judges should work to improve and enhance the rule of law, not allow a return uh, to the law of the jungle. This was a case where a, in a personal injury case, a defense attorney uh, got an uh, order to show cause for contempt issued against the plaintiff and the plaintiff's attorney because they failed to follow a court order to show up at a deposition. And the court didn't hold them in contempt and the, it just kind of like went away. Well, the plaintiff's attorney turns around and sues the uh, defense attorney for malicious prosecution. Appellate court said, no, uh, sanctions are more than enough to uh, address that issue. But they didn't stop there. Uh, they went on, make sure I got the right case here. They do. Um, they went on and said a, a couple of things I think that are important. I'd like to quote them accurately. All too often today, we see signs that the practice of law is becoming more like a business and less like a profession. We decry any such change, but the profession itself must chart its own course. Now comes this, uh, let's see. The legal profession has already suffered a loss of stature and of public respect. This is more easily understood when the public perspective of the profession is shaped by cases such as this where lawyers await the slightest provocation to turn on each other. I'm sure everybody in our audience has seen that. Perhaps you've been a victim of it, hope you haven't done it, but that's what happens. And they talk about, you know, courtesy and professionalism. Uh, it's an interesting case and I'll stop. That's what it has to say. Great, thank you, Judge Beeman. Judge Willard, were you gonna address Davenport and I think Kim versus Westmore as well? Yes, those are the two cases that um... I was going to describe uh, Davenport versus Davenport is an infamous family law case. And whenever anyone is looking for sanctions, that's the case that, that I see and then I'm, I'm reading. Uh, the screen share is partially blocked by us and our screens. Uh, it states, 
we, the Court of Appeals states, we close this discussion with a reminder to all counsel, all counsel, regardless of practice, regardless of age, that zealous advocacy does not equate with attack dog or scorched earth, nor does it mean a lack of civility. Uh, this is a case that's lengthy. Uh, I would recommend everyone reading it, no matter what you practice. Uh, the background on the case is that an inexperienced lawyer who had recently passed the bar and was not being adequately supervised engaged in a protracted, contentious, hostile, disrespectful, and unprofessional conduct that is described at great length in the Court of Appeal opinion. The Court of Appeal cites the attorney's inappropriate 52-page hearing declaration that asserted hearsay, argument, opinion, and conclusion that was improper on several bases. The attorney, in essence, testified in his declaration demeaning and reviling the opposing party. And the hearing judge, after reviewing more than a thousand pages of exhibits correspondence uh, in her detailed statement of decision, found the attorney engaged in rude, abusive, aggressive, disrespectful, and unprofessional conduct. Um, I'm going to read several of the examples which were cited at length in the opinion. Uh, these were things that the attorney wrote to opposing counsel. Quote, once again, you offer the same old tired and shop-worn excuse. Your continued blustering about mutually agreeable dates efficiency and promptness and convenience is pathetic when your client's actions negate any semblance of cooperation. Talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. Your credibility is at stake here. And then an, another correspondence, enough already with the delays. And then he demeaned the opposing counsel stating, we don't accept your implication that you didn't have the request to inspect. Perhaps you didn't look hard enough because we filed a motion to compel in which I attached the RTI set one to my declaration or you weren't counting that copy. This seems like a case of the pot calling the kettle black. In your last paragraph, your first suggestion is illusory and your last paragraph rings hollow. And then in another letter, he states, your letter appears to be an attempt to create a false and misleading exhibit for use at a later law and motion hearing. So your client can sit with the halo over his head. And so you can say, look how many times Ken offered to settle. That wouldn't surprise us at all, given your practice of attacking, of attaching a large pile of exhibits to your declarations without any testimony from you concerning their truth. Uh, this protracted litigation went on for several years and none of it appear, apparently was very pretty. When uh, confronted, the attorney was not remorseful and indicated that opposing attorneys could take it. He compounded his error when he appealed the over 400,000 sanction and attorney fees award and accused the hearing judge without any evidence of perpetrating a miscarriage of justice by refusing the follow, to follow the law, ignoring the record and re-arguing the case uh, in the court of appeal. Uh, the appellate court cites to the California attorney guidelines of civility and professionalism that discuss integrity, candor, and cooperation. Uh, an attorney should not disparage the intelligence, integrity, ethics, morals, or behavior of the court or other counsel, parties, or participants and the attorney should avoid hostile, demeaning, and humiliating words. So these indeed are words to live by, and I would encourage you to take the time and, and read this decision. Uh, the other case uh, is Kim versus uh, Westmore Partners Incorporated. You can't quite um, see what it states on the screen. It's a much shorter and straightforward opinion written by Justice Bedsworth, who was always a pure pleasure to read. And the, what you can't see on the screen, it states, for decades, our profession has given lip service to civility. All we have gotten from it is tired lips. We have reluctantly concluded that lips cannot do the job. Teeth are required. In this case, those teeth will take the form of sanctions. 
Um, in this case, an attorney basically took advantage of the opposing party and secured a baseless default judgment with a multi-million dollar award. Um, the opposing party appealed and the attorney asked the appellate court and secured from the court an extension to file his respondent's brief claiming under penalty of perjury that additional time was required because of the complex issues raised by the appellant and his need for more time to research and finalize the brief. So then the attorney filed a brief that was identical to a brief that he had previously filed with the Court of Appeal in another case, including arguments that pertain to the prior case and had nothing to do with the current case. And when notified by the appellate court that they were considering sanctioning him for this egregious conduct, the attorney basically blew off the Court of Appeal and uh, sent to the hearing another attorney who was not even aware the court was considering sanctions and was prepared only to submit the matter on the briefing. And um, counsel has an obligation to comport oneself with honesty, ethically, professionally, and with courtesy towards the opposing counsel. Uh, that was not done in this case and the offending attorney uh, earned a $10,000 sanction. So I'm going to just uh, interrupt the flow a little bit because we have a very interesting question. Um, the question is, is done as a statement. I always remain silent when I get aggressive emails, etc. And I get punished by the courts. Why? Um, Judge uh, Willard, Judge Beeman, thoughts? Remain silent when you get an aggressive email? What does that mean? Um, I'm not completely sure <laughs> that I always remain silent. Perhaps it means um, you are not doing, you're not, you're not addressing the aggressive or the bad behavior on the other side, uh, but end up getting punished by the court. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that, that, that may be dealing with a situation where the aggressive or, or unethical behavior, uncivil behavior is not put before the court. And at least my two cents is always make a record of what you're dealing with. Um, don't, don't engage in kind. That, I think that never works, but I'd appreciate the, the uh, input from our two judges. Well, let me uh, give you my two cents. I don't know enough about it to really comment. I mean, if somebody's uh, going off the handle and behaving inappropriately, and you remain silent, uh, you think the judge would see it and do something about it if it took place. And uh, you're talking about emails. Well, I'm assuming the emails before the court for some reason, uh, you, you could comment lightly or politely about it, that it's you know inappropriate. Let the judge take it. I mean, uh, judges have responsibilities to enforce these rules also. Uh, I'll let it go with that. Yeah, yeah well, you, you definitely don't engage in the improper uncivil conduct back. Um, probably you should make some sort of a professional comment um, and just leave it at that. You don't want to engage and it's just gonna get deeper and deeper and worse and worse. Yeah, essentially what you're saying is two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> Well, and, and we'll see in a few few slides uh, an example of um, where the the emails on one side did not work to their advantage. Um, so we'll we'll come back to that. And again, we, we're going to move past the slides for the second part of the program and talk about this um, some real life examples even more. But that's a great question, and there's a lot a lot more we can, we can address it. Let's let's uh, touch on a few more cases. I note, by the way, these are also fairly recent cases. So if anybody thought we've cleaned up our acts since the uh, civility oath was enacted, apparently not, at least across the board. So Judge Beeman, I know this is a case near and dear to your heart. Would you like to give us a little background? I do, but I want to comment on something you just said. You know, the bar has been addressing the issues of ethics. Everybody knows that. But when you stop and think, you know, they didn't even test on the bar exam for ethics until 1983. People like myself who graduated from law school in 73, we didn't take a test on that. We had to you know, ultimately go out, take a CEB class and come back uh, and try to apply that. But uh, there's been you know, tens of thousands of hours addressed towards this issue since it started. 
But let me talk about the case. This is called a LaSalle versus Vogel. Oh, you have it there on the screen in front of you. Um, this, they have a, oh, then here's the quote. Good, I'm glad you have that. Uh, the Code of Civil Procedure section they're quoting. Well, the appellate court, I mean, it was really a cool decision. Uh, this is a case where uh, a client, after the case is over with, decides to sue her former lawyer. She gets a new lawyer, they file a complaint, serve the uh, former attorney, and at, on the 36th day, they send a letter to that attorney and they say, uh, hey, you know, file your answer, we're going to take your default. Oh, and by the way, you have to file it in one day, one day. So they didn't file it in one day. Um, but uh, so the next day they take the default, they take a million dollar default. And for whatever reason, unbeknownst to me, the trial court wouldn't set it aside. So they had to take it up on appeal. Okay, uh, the, you have the, the quote from what the, the code of civil procedure section says. But after that quote, the court goes on to say, I hope I, this isn't all, oh, you do have the whole quote. So the, that last sentence, I, I really like, the policy of the state is that the parties to a lawsuit, quote, and they're quoting the statute, shall cooperate. Then they go to the unusual length of, of spelling out the word period, stop, full stop. You got, I don't know if you can see it on your screen. They mean it. They say in other portions of the opinion that they're reversing this thing and they're publishing it because dignity, courtesy, and integrity were conspicuously lacking. So, you know, what more do you want? <laughs> and then one thing I'd like to say, and this is a little off script, uh, Mark, uh, but, you know, it's not like you flick a switch and you say, well, you know, when I talk to Larry, I'm going to be courteous and professional and uh, ethical, and I'm going to do all those things that I was reading about. It, I, I think when you fall in and out of a mode like that, you're in part just kidding yourself. I think that you have to make it a real habit to perpetually treat people uh, professionally uh, with dignity and respect. Uh, I know we've got a lot of people in our audience. I, many lawyers live up to that all the time. It's the few that put the stain on the profession, but I'll stop. And you want me to talk about the other case? Or that's, that's yeah, just, just a moment, but I'd like to add, I, I, I think one of the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll confess when in years gone by, when I took ethics classes like this, uh, make sure I got all my credits, um, I think a lot of us tend to think, well, we do it fine. Do we really need to go through this? But the reality is, and per some of the questions we're getting, is that we periodically run into people that aren't playing by the rules. Um, they're cutting corners, they're doing things that are unethical. And I think, again, we'll, we'll do this more interactive in the later half, latter half of this uh, program, is talk about what do you do when you're dealing with that person, is, is the question was posed here. When you're dealing with the bad behavior, there's an option, which is you engage in like conduct, which I, I don't think any of us agree advances the ball. Um, there's another path, which is you just try to ignore it. You don't engage at all. And then there's something in the middle, which is you raise the issues where you need to with Judge Beeman and Judge Willard and other members of the bench when you have to, to say somebody's crossing the double yellow lines and, and you, you document it carefully. You don't engage in kind. Um, I always love the uh, Michelle Obama uh, quote about, you know, when they go low, you go high. Um, and I steadfastly, when I was a litigator, was quite happy when the people on the other side would engage in bad behavior. And I would stand off to the side, but make sure I wasn't doing what they were doing. And you'd end up in front of Judge Beam or Judge Willard or anybody. And uh, I never saw a judge who thought that bad behavior was acceptable. Um, so I think it's, care it's careful, <clears throat> carefully memorializing what's going on to address it, not ignore it entirely to address it. Well, I think it's, it's also important to remember that um, we all have bad days and we all do things that we regret and we all make mistakes. So I think that, um, you know, reviewing the rules, thinking about the rules, attending things, sessions like this helps us to just practice the profession of law in a civil 
and appropriate way so that you don't fall into bad patterns or, um, or problems. You know, I can think of things that I was thinking but never said on the bench that would have been totally inappropriate. You just have to train yourself to act in a professional manner. And can I, can I follow up on that? I, I got a little quote here. This, this isn't something I dreamed up. I found it elsewhere. We are that, we, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. And so that's what you're talking about. You're talking about really kind of almost like forming a way of life, uh, forming a way of practicing the profession consistently all the time. So you don't have to worry about on and off type things. Mm -hmm. that's that's a great quote i really appreciate it um let's let's um touch on what i i'll describe as sort of a new mutation we're talking about viruses all all these days and the new mutation of the current coronavirus there seems to be a new mutation in terms of uncivil or unethical behavior um so um i'd like to talk for a minute about Unfortunately, two new cases, which means the issue's still alive. Um, I think, again, uh, Josh Beeman, did you want to start on Brigante? Yes. Uh, in this case, it's an anti slap case. The uh, moving party won about half of what they were seeking at the trial court level and did not win the other half. So they appealed the half they lost. Well, this case, uh, the court uh, said they. They were publishing this case because it provided a teachable moment. They said they did not want to punish or embarrass the offender, but they found it to be a teachable moment. The, in the opening brief, the uh, moving party, the appellant, uh, decides it'd be a good idea to uh, say the following, which is the remaining change after the trial judge book. So they're talking about the trial judge, an attractive, hardworking, brilliant, young, politically well-connected judge on a fast track for the California Supreme Court or federal bench went on and, and describes what the judge did. In the same paragraph, this lawyer decides it'd be a good idea to say, with due respect, every so often, an attractive, hardworking, brilliant, young, politically well-connected judge can err. Uh, let's review the errors. Well, this appellate court, <laughs> they, uh, they did a very nice, clean job of dissecting and bisecting the attorney that made these statements. I'll just give you a couple of sentences here. Um, They, they point out the obvious that uh, such comments would not likely have been made about a male judge. They talked about how irrelevant and sexist it was. And let me see, what is the quote? There? Oh, you've got the quote right there in front of you. So I won't read that to you. Um, maybe the, oh, the quote stops a little short. Uh, they say, we review judgments and judicial rulings, not physical or other supposed personal characteristic characteristics of superior court judges. Uh, they, they, they have a concluding sentence here. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, we well, oh, they, they have a nice paragraph about professionalism in writing. I mean, if you want to feel good about yourself, uh, read this paragraph. I'm not going to read it all, but it, we welcome creativity and do not require perfection. We simply did not find the peculiar style and content of this brief's opening paragraph appropriate, helpful, or persuasive. I mean, you all understand that's a nice way of telling them it massively screwed up. Um, so that's it on that case. Great, great. And I think they are bookends to some extent, Judge Willard. Do you want to describe the Martinez case? Yes, Martinez versus O'Hara, which is a very brief and troubling case uh, where the attorney, plaintiff's attorney committed misconduct on appeal, including manifesting gender bias. Uh, I think the case is remarkable in that it's, it's 
the only part that's published is the part that discusses the the crazy uh, things that the plaintiff's attorney said. And it looks like it's uh, still pending before the bar. Um, the notice of appeal was signed by the attorney referring to the ruling of the female judicial officer as succubustic. And a succubus is defined as a demon assuming a female form which has sexual intercourse with men in their sleep. Uh, the notice of appeal got worse when it referred to genitalia and the inner workings of the intestine. Uh, again, it's a very short case and I'll leave it up to you to peruse it at your leisure. Um, it was almost like the attorney had gone through some sort of a psychic break or something. It was totally inappropriate. Uh, this of course constituted un unambiguous gender bias, harassment and prejudice and the attorney was reported to the state bar. I think it's, it's still pending. I don't know what the future holds for this particular council. And thank you for mentioning that. I'll just second the, the judge's comments. Uh, Briganti in particular is, is a great, relatively short opinion. Uh, and Martinez um, also is brief, but they're dealing with uh, extreme and extremely inappropriate behavior. Um, and I'm glad the court is confronting those issues, not just on civil, but gender specific comments, inappropriate ones. Um, so you might think it's all relatively clear, <clears throat> but in the category of a few, a few more examples, not everyone's getting the message, I'd like to share a few. By the way, this is after paring down a list that grows and grows and grows. Um, somebody who sort of tracks these things, not all that carefully, just reading the legal headlines like the rest of you. Um, too many stories pop up. And I want to share a couple. Um, first, <clears throat> this is actual transcript from an actual case. We're reading about it because it made the news because the lawyer is being sanctioned. Um, but in a, in a uh, what we'd otherwise think is a normal course of a deposition, <clears throat> I'll just quickly go through it. The plaintiff's counsel is asking their normal questions about somebody provided you a vehicle and the defense counsel says, I object. And why would, well, to the plaintiff said, well, what you should answer. And the defendant said, it's ridiculous. I'll object and direct you not to answer. Plaintiff then said, certify the question. Defense attorney, maybe he had too much coffee or not enough, said, okay, then certify your own stupidity at this point. Plaintiff's counsel did what they should do and say, I'm not going to sit here and take insults from you. Defense counsel said, at this point in time, a man who insults on a daily basis, everybody he does business with has been elected president of the United States. No names mentioned here. The standards have changed. I'll say what I want. Um, again, in the small type at the bottom there, it references the disciplinary hearing that took place uh, as a result of that. Um, more troubling, what worth mentioning is anybody who thinks that um, inappropriate behavior elsewhere has allowed this um, should read the underlying opinion because it didn't go well for them. Um, one other example, and it's unfortunately not Chicago where I think this case is from, but more locally, and this is the give you the, the parental warning, the next slide may be unsuitable for children and the faint of heart. Um, <clears throat> going back to our email conversation, this is the actual language, although the asterisks have been added to protect the, the more, um, more demure people here. This is taken from an email exchange between an attorney by the name of Christopher Hook and attorneys um, who were representing Allstate. Now, this phenomenon is not that unusual. The attorney, Christopher Hook, was complaining that it was taking a long time for the insurance company to respond. <clears throat> so decided it was appropriate to send an email. This, by the way, is only an excerpt of several emails. Um, you can see the use in this case. Um, I'm not going to read it, um, <clears throat> but it's worth um, pausing over it. Um, and by the way, this was only, and I, this was not a singular example in other communications. Mr. Hooks um, used homophobic slurs referred to the um, attorney's home, identified the address to say, I know where you live. Um, <clears throat> why do we know about this? Well, it made news several times. 
initially when it was brought before a sitting federal judge in the Central District of California um, on a sanctions motion. The motion was granted immediately um, and a, um, in order to show cause was entered. And in a subsequent hearing, the judge um, demanded that the attorney resign from the bar. Now, I don't know that the judge can, can order that, but I know the judge ordered um, the matter be referred to the state bar. Mr. Hook in turn lost his client, no surprise there, and sanctions were subsequently entered. Um, in his defense, and I put the word defense in quotation marks, Christopher Hooks raised two arguments. One was the First Amendment allows him to do this sort of thing. The sitting judge did not agree. And then secondly, referenced, um, he referenced the fact that he was having some mental health issues and somehow that was to make it all okay. Uh, again, the court did not agree. Um, I've lost track since it got referred to the state bar, but I don't imagine they were very receptive to the behavior. Um, these again are only two examples. Um, one of the great programs where I had the uh, pleasure to meet Judge Beeman was we were both on a program sponsored by an organization called the Boda um, American Bar of Trial Attorneys who have done a phenomenal job putting on multiple programs on the topic of civility and they can fill up two hours with real life video transcript examples that never cease to exist. Um, and um, I recommend highly um, that if you have a chance to attend one of those, walk, go to it. It will make you somewhat depressed, but, but also I think mindful of good and bad behavior and how badly the bad behavior works for people like Mr. Hooks or the attorney in the prior example. Um, so it does happen. Um, but let's pause on that because uh, I, I, I really appreciate Judge Willard and Judge Beeman weighing in on, are you seeing, what, what are your thoughts about what's contributing to either a recurrence or an increase in uncivil or unethical behavior? Judge? Oh, well, you know, I, I used to see on the bench, um, I think the result of a lot of reality TV shows like Judge Judy, where people, you know, self-represented parties and sometimes even lawyers would come in and expect me to wail on the opposing side or the litigants the same way that Judge Judy does, um, which of course is, would be totally improper. And, uh, you know, that type of behavior ramps things up in any event, but I uh, consider that to be very detrimental. I read once that Judge Judy was the judge who was most reported to the Judicial Performance Commission, which of course she's not under their jurisdiction anyway. It's a TV show. This is not, this is not real life. So, you know, I find, I found that that would be very, very problematic. Um, I think other problems are just people seem to be angrier now, less inclined to listen, less inclined to have a civil discussion about issues and ideas. Um, those are things that I think it would be nice to go back to what I remember to be the good old days where you could have a, a civil disagreement and just talk about things and, and exchange ideas. And it seems like life has in general become more aggressive and, uh, uncivil, people seem to be less inclined to listen to each other. Um, another problem I think is email and the social media where you can toss off some very uncivil um, missives without even thinking about it and without taking the time like in the olden days, if you were writing a letter to opposing counsel and you were upset, you'd dictate something, the secretary would type it up and then you'd look it over as a draft and sometimes you'd put it away, sometimes you'd modify it, sometimes you'd send it, depended upon what was in it. But, you know, we seem to be living a life that's that's much faster paced and and just much more aggressive. Uh, I mm -hmm. agree. <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, I think everybody in the audience would agree. When you think about it, the law business itself is difficult. Uh, it, you know, if you, there are different governmental agencies perhaps that don't have 
quite as much pressure as private practice, but a lot of them do. I mean, think of district attorney or public defender's offices that are so underfunded and they're carrying such a huge caseload. Well, you know, that takes its toll on the individual. I made a short list here when we were talking the other day, I'm gonna go over it. I mean, it is very difficult for a lawyer to keep their life in balance. Uh, the law business can be very consuming. I mean, how many of you people have spent seven days a week in your office for month after month after month? Uh, you can only do that for so long. It really has a very negative effect on your outlook on life. But other than saying that, you know, you have the economic pressures you're aware of, the cost of litigation, what, what it, the, the amount of money it takes to properly fund and run an office. Meanwhile, you're supposed to be uh, uh, staying current with all the rules and, and appropriately remembering them, applying them to all your, your cases, trying not to get sued or reported to the bar. Meanwhile, clients are making negative reviews about you on Yelp. Uh, there's so much competition out there. One lawyer will promise, you know, the, the heaven and earth to a client just to get the client. And then you have to compete with that when you're not getting the business. Think about the cost involved with electronic discovery. Electronic discovery is, can be a world all of its own and it can just be massively expensive. You, well, you have to, how much time do you have to pay to your trust account? The state bar catches you, uh, violating the rules there, you've got some trouble on your hands. Uh, you have to maintain your own health. You have to look out for your family. So that's why I say balance. And uh, it's, it's not easy carrying the pressures of a law practice. Many lawyers, I mean, I know, I used to know uh, lawyers that had 100, 130 cases, and they were just like an accident waiting to happen. Uh, we started fast track, uh, back in the second half of the 80s, as I recall, and some lawyers have toned it down, but some haven't. But uh, it, those are what I see as contributing to this nastiness and this anger. And just like you said, I mean, when you have, you know, high public officials behaving as poorly as these, some of these lawyers we're reading about, it's no wonder that people think it's okay. Now, being a lawyer is very stressful to begin with. You're making a living by handling a heavy dose of conflict. And that's every single day. And that makes the conflict part of your life. And you're based to, you're, you are paid to fight. You know, it's, it's constant conflict. And, and not, not to in any way excuse Christopher Hook's behavior or anybody like them. There's just uh, recurring data that shows the level of anxiety and stress in our profession is among one of the higher levels, um, which, is, which is unfortunate. Again, not an excuse at all, but um, especially I think in this COVID world, there's the additional stresses about jobs and practices and economics that are contributing. Not to make it okay, indeed, that's why I put up this slide to underscore the point that um, you know, outside of Washington, no, the standards have not changed. And, as you can see from LaSalle, Brigante, and all these other cases, the courts are continuing to impose sanctions and in some cases devoting extra time and a very, very busy schedule to reinforce those principles. Um, and we touched on a few of the cases, but if you read most of them, there's a significant economic cost as well as personal cost of the lawyers who violate that. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes, if you bear with me, because I do want to touch on the, the issue of brain science, because I think it circles back. This is a personal journey I've been on for more than 20 years, trying to answer the question when I'm doing mediations of what's going on here when clients and lawyers um, are adamant that their case is much better than I think it is. Um, and that led me over the years to find some just remarkable work. We'll spend only a few minutes on it. The, there are references to the people that I'll touch on quickly in the reading material. I strongly recommend you, you take a look at it. Um, quickly, uh, there's two bodies of work. One that focuses on client perception and handicapping. The other one that focuses on attorney perception and handicapping. Two different bodies of work. You'll see some interesting parallels. 
So let me tell you quickly about one of uh, one category on the client perception and handicapping. This is work that was undertaken over a multi-year um, study by a professor, a brilliant person at the University of California, Davis School of Law, Donna Shostowski. And she worked for years on a multi-jurisdictional study of um, essentially focusing on how parties, meaning actual clients, evaluate different litigation procedures, negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and trial. That was the primary focus of her work. Uh, a secondary part of that work was to look at the party's confidence in their litigation prospects, how well they think they are doing or going to do. So briefly, what her findings were, and some of this might resonate with all of us that do, have done on the litigation, the more confident you are of winning, you prefer to litigate. You're convinced you're going to win, let's go win. Um, as opposed to conciliating. Um, but the other, the secondary part of work, I'm showing in a second, is data that shows a, a, a somewhat scary level of client overconfidence, that it's real, it defies logic and threatens unpleasant surprises. So this is a chart uh, generated through her work, which um, she measures by, inter by inter interviewing, her team interviewing these, again, multi-jurisdictions. This isn't just California, multi-jurisdiction and asking people to project their level of confidence in their outcome. Now, this is a situation where no one has gone to trial or arbitration or adjudication. They're just estimating how likely they are to win. Now, interestingly, before we talk about the right side and the red arrows, look way over on the left side. According to this data, roughly 4% of the people think they have zero chance of winning. I don't know about you, I would love to sit with those people and say, so what's going on here? Um, but that's for another day. But look <laughs> at the right side. And this is where the data is somewhat scary. And again, I will confess to a pick law school because I didn't want to do any more math, but let's, let's talk about what the data shows. It shows that 70% of the, that group says they believe they have a 70% chance of winning, 54% think they have a 90% chance of winning, and 23% believe they have a 100% chance of winning. The math doesn't work. What it does indicate is clients, for multiple reasons, um, have a belief that their prospects are much higher than they are. And it's something we confront in the course of our mediation work. Um, so that's, that's number one. Now, number two, turns out lawyers do their own version of the same thing. And here I refer back to another just brilliant person who, um, former uh, Berkeley law student who shifted, shifted careers, essentially midway through a very successful private practice and got into understanding decision-making and the process for lawyers, Randy Kaiser. Now, unlike the um, Don Shiskasi work, um, here the focus was on measuring and comparing um, situations where a litigation matter had gone through a, some type of pretrial settlement effort, uh, but it did not settle, and then went to a litigation outcome. And so in each case, the comparison was between what was on the table that was turned down and what actually happened. Um, to make it uh, make the study um, more robust, their team did actually four studies separated by multiple years and did some of them in California, some of them in New York. And just staggeringly, the results were virtually identical. And here's what they showed. The plaintiff error rate was 60%. That means 60% of the time plaintiffs did less well through the adjudicated outcome than what was available to them prior to the adjudication. And this, by the way, does not factor in the additional cost and time of going forward. This is just purely what was on the table monetarily and what did you end up getting? So 60% of the time the plaintiffs um, failed or lost. Um, now, here the defendant error rate, 25%. There's a gap in between there about 15% to make 100, which were when the results were too unclear, ambiguous. But 25%, if you do primarily defense work, you might go, hey, yeah, we won. 
But wait a moment. <clears throat> now, what did this translate into in dollars? And this is a study again, it's several years old now, but the, but the average in all the studies combined was the average cost of planets was 70, $73,400. That was what was left on the table on average. Um, and that's real money still today. Now here's where it gets interesting. The average cost of the defendant error was $1.4 million. Um, pretty staggering hit. So in summary, defendants uh, error in terms of their uh, comparing what was on table versus what, out, out, what the outcome was, only one out of four time. But when the hit comes in, it's real bad. Now, uh, when, by the way, when this, uh, the initial study was uh, published and got national news, uh, Randy got uh, thoroughly challenged and criticized by lawyers all over the country saying, this can't be right. This must be a California thing. It must be a small lawyer uh, firm problem versus big law. It must have to do with the fact that some lawyers are younger and, and uh, not, not a senior people who know better. So um, <clears throat> he uh, re-ran all the same data and guess what? The results were essentially the same, regardless of council experience, large versus small matter, dispute matter, geography, it's not a California thing, it's not a New York thing. And then of course, the net costs have not even been adjusted to reflect um, the additional costs of work going forward and the disruption of litigation. So where does that take us? Um, and how does this tie to civility? So the, the main point going, wanted to share in part of this before we will go into some practical strategy in a few minutes is we're all pre-wired. We're all pre-wired to over, overstate the positive and understate the negative. We don't necessarily do it consciously, but we all do it. There was a fascinating article in the Wall Street Journal a few years ago where it was looking at golfers and how golfers tend to make errors in terms of how far they think they can hit a golf ball be, as opposed to where they actually hit it. So it turns out we all remember our best shot much better than we remember our worst shot. So it's not even a lawyer versus non-lawyer thing. We all tend to overstate the positive and underweight the negatives and the trade-offs. So when you realize that's going on in the back of everybody's mind, the question is where does civility play a part? If we're already pre-wired to discount the bad news in a litigation matter, the bad news is what the other people are saying. It's people across the table are saying about your position versus their position. If we're already pre-wired to do that and you engage in uncivil behavior, what's the natural human reaction? The natural human reaction is to fight over the accusations, not fight over the substance. And most importantly, to not listen, literally to filter out the information. Um, so, we want to jump from this, but before I want to pause, before we go to our, our part B, because I went through that quickly, Judge Beam and Judge Willard, more thoughts on the brain science part of this? Yes. Um, you know, our whole time here this morning is two hours. Uh, <laughs> there's such a library of information that has developed in the last 20 years on brain science. And it is absolutely fascinating. Uh, people, I mean, members of the audience, uh, you'd be doing yourself a, a real good service if you spent some time on your own in reading some of the books. One of the books I, uh, I read it was uh, this guy, Lewis. I think his name's Michael Lewis. It's just not in our credits here at the end. It's, it's, I think it's called the, the Undoing Project. And uh, it's almost like reading a textbook. For me, it was a little laborious and took forever, but it's well worth it. He makes the point. And, and it causes you to kind of analyze yourself, you know, why did I do that? Why would I do that? Why would I react this way? It's a very good book, but there's, there's a lot of them out there. One of the articles that Mark mentioned, we've attached as a citation to the materials you have here. Uh, it, it just underscores the accuracy of everything Mark said. It's called Insightful or Wishful, Lawyers' Ability to Predict Case Outcomes. 
and it's it's very interesting. You will enjoy it. There is a good deal of math in it. That part I kind of skipped over, uh, but the other part, it's it's great. I think you'll really enjoy it, and uh, people are devoting their lives to this, uh, studying this, and they're learning and learning and learning. So I'll stop. And Judge yeah. Willard? This is really the first time I've ever really heard about brain science per se, and I think that it, it really uh, shows itself when you're going into that mediation and you're trying to get people to open up their minds and listen to the other side and to um, come to some sort of a compromise and an agreement. Uh, because we really are sort of set in what we believe and, and don't want to move off of that position. And you know, I, I can see how it just makes settling so much more difficult. Well, and you, you both have, have highlighted, we'll, we'll talk about it some more, um, the issue that this process we deal with is, is built upon stress and anxiety. It's clients who have um, things are not working the way they want to or the way they had hoped to, whether they're an individual, whether they're a corporation, something bad has happened, they're dealing with bad news because the other side's not doing something they should have done or they didn't do something they should have done. Then you have the other layer of, of lawyers trying to do their very best for those clients, again, corporate or individual, and the stress of, I wanna get the best result for them. And in the, in the context of trying to settle, dealing with the fact that you've got people on the other side of the dispute that are seeing the world differently. Um, I went through this quickly because recognizing that, that normal brain science about discounting what the other side says, civility is more critical than I think in any other area of the law because you can only get a deal done if people reach an agreement. Um, it, this isn't about what Judge Beeman decides or the arbitrator decides or the jury decides. Um, you're only going to get something done by getting the other person to change their position, the other company, the other side to change their position, which requires that they actually hear what you have to say and recalibrate. Um, hence, the civility is more important. I was, I was lucky a few years ago to teach at uh, UC Davis's School of Law a course I developed on the topic of mediation advocacy, not how to be a mediator. There's tons of great, great education on that. This was more focused on what's different about the lawyer's role in mediation. And I politely told all of my students, they're only gonna get graded down for certain things. And one of them is using words like frivolous or specious or any, anything that are unnecessarily attacking words. You can attack positions, you cannot attack people. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and consistently two or three of my 24 students didn't get the message and they got marked down because if you're writing that the other side is engaging in the process of that old game of saying, I know you are, but what am I? No one is listening to the substance of your position. They're listening to the attack and figuring out their counterattack. So uncivil behavior not only doesn't advance the ball, it puts you much further behind the ball than you can be. Um, and, and so let me, let me, two more slides and then I promise we turn slides off for a bit, but I wanna to get to a list of great insights. By the way, if anybody thinks this is a new concept, it's not. So Judge Beeman, you, you found these great citations. You wanna provide a little context? Yeah, well, you know, a little demonstrative evidence, you know. I bought this at a bookstore over in San Anselmo uh, and you can find it online. Uh, there were, uh, you know, he's got 110 uh, rules of uh, civility and decent behavior, but uh, believe it or not, some of them actually apply to the law business. Uh, the, the one, this is a, perhaps the most important one, labor to keep alive in your breast that little spark of celestial fire called conscience. That's a good one. Undertake not uh, what you cannot perform but be careful to keep your promise. Last one. Speak not injurious words, neither in jest nor earnest. Scoff at none, although they may give occasion. Uh, but you know what's interesting is that 
thinking of you talking a couple hundred years people have been talking about this uh we need to make more progress more rapidly but anyway i just thought you folks folks might find that interesting and funny so it, it's worth yeah so thank you for raising it it's definitely worth going through the longer list we just put a couple on the screen but it is just it's very mindful I, you know again I love the first one on the slide. Every action done in company ought to be done with some sign of respect to those that are present. Um, it, it's, it sounds so basic, but we're talking about this issue. California imposed a civility oath because not everyone gets the message. Uh, so let me, let's talk about navigating and stra strategies for navigating those issues. And I'm gonna, hopefully make this work by stop the screen share. Here we go. So we're just on screen ourselves and I will see if we can go from there. So um, if I could, I'm gonna take a look at the questions in, in a moment here. Um, so I've been doing this, we go forward, but let's take a step or two back. Um, so Judge Willard, You've been both um, on the bench for a number of years and been you know, working uh, um, as a media for a number of years. And you also, I know, work in the family law area. I, I, let's start with some perspective. It compares, compare the settlement conference process when you're on the bench to the um, process of the private mediation work. And, and do you see the same behaviors um, in, both, in both settings? that I really see the, the same behaviors. I remember when, uh, when I was on the bench, we would have less time devoted to settlements of, of cases. And I found that in court, and I do some settlement conferences now also, I approach it more with a hammer as opposed to a persuasion perspective and uh, seem to short, shortcut the process some. And um, I think in, in terms of mediation, it's something that I've had to, to learn is to learn not to walk in there and judge the case, you know, to be able to step back, persuade, discuss back and forth, um, point out issues without, you know, making, making a ruling as it were. So, you know, I find that to be a, a very, uh, distinctive difference. And also in um, settlement conferences with self-represented parties, they, I found them to be more, e more easily um, persuaded as it were, you know, you've got the judge and the robe and, and they're more inclined to, to listen. But um, I think those were the, the biggest thing, the hammer of the settlement conference versus the persuasive nature of a, of a mediation. Judge Beeman, what's, what's been your observations? Well, uh, a lot of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was lucky uh, when I was on the bench because, you know, this direct calendaring in a civil department gives you as a judge, a decision maker, a lot more control over cases. And I was able to set like a full day of settlement for a settlement conference frequently and we could take our time as you can in mediation and discuss the thing. Uh, one thing that was uh, more than a little frustrating in uh, settlement conferences and it is in mediation is that's when a, the a lawyer, like the, the, the plaintiff's lawyer, for example, doesn't give his own brief to the plaintiff to let them read it. Or, and then they can com compound that by not giving the defendant's brief. So they realize there's two sides to the story and it's some important document, let's talk about like a defense medical. They don't give that to the plaintiff. So the plaintiff doesn't understand really the merit, substance or depth of the defendant's argument. And they kind of think it's all pie in the sky the way they see it. Well, I think that uh, in a joint session, when I was a judge and you could order that when you were a judge, uh, it really kind of shocked some people into a recognition of reality, what the facts are. And the, the whole idea of letting one side see how the other side communicates, how they talk, what kind of impression, 
that was a big deal. I may be getting way ahead of where we want to go with your question right now, Mark, but in, in, in private mediation, some people would rather jump out of the building than have a joint session. And I think there's a great deal to be obtained uh, from a joint session. I could talk about that for a long time, but I'll stop right now. No, I, I want to I get back to the joint sessions uh, with all of you. I'm going to just uh, take, a, take the interlude just to reference a couple of things. So uh, one of the questions we got was uh, providing the name of the Michael Lewis book. It's called The Undoing Project. And it is a great read. If you've not read Michael Lewis for other topics, whatever he writes is worth reading. He's just one of the better uh, writers today. And it's basically a uh, chrono, well, it's a, somewhat of a biography of two brilliant people, um, Daniel Tversky, uh, no, Daniel Kahneman, and I forgot Tversky's the other one. These two completely dissimilar, uh, but brilliant um, behavioral scientists. And it's as much a biography of the two of them as it is of their underlying work, but there it is, it's very, very thoughtful. Uh, one of the side stories has to do with a Toronto-based physician. Uh, I forgot his area specialization, but his career transformed into being, um, what he did was with the hospital's full approval, was he would follow around emergency room doctors uh, who would, you know, would be faced with critical care situations and watch what they were doing to provide another set of eyes to what was going on in the diagnosis and the treatment, uh, recognizing that most of those were true emergencies or something had to be decided quickly. Um, that one was one of the most fascinating side stories to me because what he did periodically was say, wait a minute, let's not go there um, in a particular uh, type of treatment, which could have had permanent uh, you know, negative impacts. The, the punchline to that story was, um, is essentially we all look for patterns and that applies to when we're talking about mediations. We see a case, we think it's this type of case, we start fitting in the box, it's this type of case. But sometimes it's not that type of case, it's something else and the, you know, to, to Judge Beeman's point, when we talk about things like sharing your statement, your, your mediation statement, joint, uh, joint sessions, it's the opportunity to show the other side, this isn't in that box, this is a different, this is, does not fit the pattern that you think it is, just because it's this type of case. And I've had some, of the, I've had some brilliant lawyers that I've worked with who go out of their way to, among other things, send their brief to the other side very early on, not when I ask them to, before I ask them to, so they can get it to the other side, whether there's a corporation, whether there's insurance companies involved. And one person, I remember, I think I shared this with Judge Beeman and Judge Willard is an example. I remember picking up the phone and calling the attorney saying, do I have the date wrong? Because we're not meeting for six weeks. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. I know it's six weeks, but this is the horrific, extreme example of a particular type of case um, supported by a, a wealth of information. Um, and he wanted to make sure the other side not only saw it, but they had time to process it because it didn't fit into that box. So apropos the undoing project, read that case, but think about it in a broader context of how do we, you know, how do you take some of that great work and go, what do we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Can I say something on what, what points you touched on there? The confidentiality. You know, you write this brilliant, you know, unbelievably great, perfect brief, and then you don't share it with the people that you want to persuade. And how much sense does that make? Uh, I mean, there are rare, rare occasions where two or three pieces of evidence might have to be kept confidential. You can provide that to the mediator separately. If you have such a wonderful brief, exchange it. Try to influence the other people. And Mark's statement obviously is correct. Get it in early, 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 early. Uh, I mean, I could go on a lot, but I'll stop right there. No, 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 Judge, Judge Willard? Well, it does require more preparation to get it in early, but it's well worth it if you can do it. 
And I also find that if you've been open and honest and exchanging your briefs and the information is back and forth, it really cuts down on that early time when, you know, people are just sort of trying to figure out, okay, what is this case about? Everybody knows what the case is about. And I, as a mediator, have a better idea of, you know, what am I going to do to, to help this, this case settle? So it's, it's well worth it. In the timing, just to stay on that um, topic, sometimes the decision maker on the other side is just whoever shows up for that mediation. Uh, but sometimes there's multiple constituents and it could be even family dynamics. It could be, um, it could be somebody at home who's part of the conversation about what's fair, what's right, what we should do. It could be a, a fact that there's insurance at play and there's sometimes multiple levels of authority to get to a certain levels of approval. It could be people that are showing up aren't the actual ultimate decision makers at a company, but that company decision makers all got together for the mediation and said, this is, this, we all agree, this is, it's worth between X and Y, but we politely don't see it between X and Y. We see it in a different playing field. So all the more reason if you want to help people set appropriate expectations for whatever happens later on is to share that information. Um, now, I know this is a somewhat co controversial notion and not all lawyers agree about sharing their briefs, but what I politely do is to say, hey, you know, you pick this profession because you believe you're a good advocate. Use that brief, as, as Judge Beeman just said, that well-written brief to convince the other side as well as me, I'm gonna help you as much as I can, but this is this is that opportunity for advocacy. You know, the expression I heard one time is called percolate. You get the information and you look at it, you may read it in its entirety, you may not, but it takes a while to absorb the information and then kind of evaluate it. How am I gonna change my position? How am I gonna respond, uh, you know, two or three reads are often necessary to accurately understand a complex case. The other thing I'd point out from the client's point of view, you know, people can only accept so much truth at one time. So if you get this to them earlier, they get a chance to sit down and talk about it with their lawyer. They don't come in and just get, you know, lamb blasted with some truth that they've been deny in denial about for the last five years. Uh, there's tremendous advantages to getting it in early. Yeah, and I think if you've got a, a brief that's well-written, civil, not as non-attacking, it's just the facts, it lays it out, you get it to them early, it's, it's much better than when it's dumped at the last minute, they walk into the office, and the next thing I know is, oh, you're acting in bad faith, is the allegation, they sling back and forth, and and part of my time is wasted trying to get them not to head for the elevator and, and stock out and, and upset. So, you know, this, I think this, this all really does help and, and promotes settlement. You know, being civil, factual, respectful, you can be firm, but, you know, you don't have to go in there and, and light a fire. So, so in terms of the setup to make, make it work as well as possible, um, I wanted to get some input in terms of the, your, your interaction, I'll share my two cents, um, about the preparation for the mediation. How do you get ahead of those issues if, if you can? What do you do pre-mediation that might help keep people thinking about a certain avenue, a certain course that avoids the uncivil behavior? Judge Wooler? Well, I, I always, um, before a mediation, will have separate telephone calls, sometimes multiple calls with the attorneys. And I've even done it when I've had self-represented parties where I will call them up and, and talk to them. Um, but I think that that's crucial. I, I like to see the briefs before so I don't have to play catch up on well, what's this case about. And um, I'll have questions typically. I'll wanna know, you know, what, what is the real background? What's the history of this case? What are the emotions? And that goes beyond family law. Family law, of course, is riddled with emotions, but so are many other cases. Most cases, in fact, probably have some sort of an emotional base. 
Do the parties get along? Do counsel get along? Uh, sometimes the attorneys have had cases with each other before, or maybe they've just developed bad blood on this particular case. And, you know, I, I'm seeking information that is going to help me be ready to think about how am I going to resolve this case? How am I going to bring everybody together where they've compromised and we have a, a resolution? Uh, so I think that that's absolutely essential is the contact and enough time to have the contact with uh, counsel beforehand. I agree. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you, obviously you're, you're spot on. I mean, one of the, some, some different ideas though about the same subject, you want to avoid surprises. So when you get a, you get a brief, if you get it, I mean, you get a, a two inch brief like two days before and you're working eight hours a day uh, the two days before, when was I supposed to understand this or learn it? You, you're, you're deprived of an opportunity of doing a good job. So you avoid surprising the mediator. You avoid surprising yourself and your opponent. And, and, and the, about the calls in advance, I always make the calls in advance. And I learn so much. You, you ask questions about what you read in the brief that weren't perhaps fully answered, or there's a deposition of a PMK that's supposed to take place from the time the brief was submitted to the time of the, of the mediation. You find out what was said. What else is there? Why hasn't it settled? You get the history of the negotiations. Uh, there's just so much that you can ask and you can really try to begin to establish some type of rapport with the attorneys too, so that they can, you know, I mean, really, they really, they can trust you. They'll open up and tell you more why this case has lingered for five or six years. Uh, getting the brief early, having a chance to talk to the attorneys, you know, maybe three or four times before the mediation, you're front loading it. You don't want to get there and have a, you know, a, a a piece of information that is crucial to the case resolving, not available. Don't have it, didn't do it, don't know where it is, forgot it. That just doesn't cut it. Yeah, yeah one thing I've found from um, the lawyers sometimes is they know their case so well that in their brief, they've jumped some of the facts to just get to the conclusion. And, you know, every so often you need to ask, you know, back them up and ask them, okay, now, what supports this particular conclusion? And I always want to know discovery. Are you ready for mediation? What are you, what are you missing? What do you think you're missing? What um, is going to make you more comfortable to resolve this case? And I, th I think what you're hearing from uh, Judge Beeman and Judge Willard, and I fully agree, is we use those pre-calls to help think about how to help you that day. Um, rather than take a cookie cutter approach to this process. And I, I truly believe most situations are unique um, and avoiding that pattern uh, thing that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and the best way to do that is let us start engaging with you. Um, I am a true believer that a significant portion of the time there's the dispute about the legal merits and there's all sorts of other things that are floating around in the background. Um, that have to do with dynamics again, whether they're individual, whether they're home, whether they're organizational, whether they're having to do with bankruptcy issues, whatever they may be. And I'm struck by the number of times those things don't get put into the briefs. Now, by the way, on this whole issue of, of briefing and sharing your brief, one of the points of resistance uh, I sometimes run into is, well, there's some things you need to know and we can't put that in the brief because for strategic reason or whatever other reasons, we don't want to offend the other people. Um, you know, we have that problem. And I go, share your main brief and write a side letter to me, anything you want, or we'll get on the call, we'll get on the phone ahead of time. So you can do both. Um, not to play hide the ball with the other side. I'm, I'm also pretty careful about saying, what's super secret here that you don't think they already know? or they're going to find out, or you're required to disclose pre-trial anyway. And if it really matters, if it really matters, let's use it now to make the case go away. Um, so sharing the briefs is important. I, I, think, I think, Judge Beeman, you mentioned earlier, when we talk about sharing the briefs, think about the consequences, linking back to civility, linking back to 
the brain science, think about the consequences if you don't share your brief. If the client only sees your brief, not the other side's brief, well, going back to the brain science, everybody then gets reinforced in thinking, yeah, we're right, the other side's wrong, all the facts are in our favor, we can't lose. That's not conducive to a reasoned conversation. So yet another reason to get that brief um, to the other side, and obviously in the most readable fashion, so they actually listen to it, they actually hear your position rather than go, oh, they just accused us of this, well, we're gonna accuse them of that. Um, that that's not a productive process. I mean, the other thing about the pre-call too is you can have polite conversations about your approach, what you would like to do as the advocate, what the mediator's thoughts might be, and sir, in, in setting the stage. And one thing I always politely do is say, we may be doing this all separately, we may be doing it in joint caucuses, but if we do, we're not gonna be rereading our briefs. I've already read them really thoroughly. What we're gonna do is try to get to some points. What are the facts? Where's the gaps between them? And if we have that kind of conversation, we're gonna do it as neutrally as possible. What, what my, my last observation on that front is being in the, in the client seat for a number of years in general counsel role, the number of times um, when you, by the way, when you, when you step into a company as general counsel, you in here, whatever's legal, you start looking at all the piles of things, start meeting with lawyers, typically very good lawyers, and you ask questions as I did, which is, well, if our case is this strong or their case is this weak, why don't we go show them that now rather than later? And the number of times in multiple situations where the response back was, well, that won't work because they're who they are. They're uncivil. Let me tell you this example, that example of bad behavior. And I don't mention that to say that those things didn't happen. I'm sure they did. Um, I also suspect we probably piled on to on our side. But what's, what's interesting to me and, and comments for anybody um, is the number of times people say it won't work to mediate because they are who they are, because they're uncivil, because this is the, this is the people we're dealing with. And my polite response is, yeah, we're going to try anyway. Um, and then you end up between a judge, before a Judge Beeman or a Judge Willard who politely won't let people misbehave in front of them. And guess what? Most of the time, those people clean up their act anyway. And if they don't, I think that with the influence of a, of a great neutral, you get, you're, you're having the conversation you should have, not the conversation everybody's afraid would take place. But I'm curious, uh, Judge Willard, Judge Beeman, how, much, how many times do you have the bad behavior before you in, in, in mediations um, as a, you know, compared to the total volume of things you see? Well, mediations, I, I don't see bad behavior. I, I have one private case where there's been some bad behavior and I find that's more difficult because either on Zoom or in a conference room, I don't have my trusty bailiff to uh, kind of, you know, help maintain order, but I do find that overall, uh, in front of me, people seem to really behave themselves really much, much better than, than I saw in court. Well, I've had four or five situations as a private mediator that uh, I wish had gone differently. Uh, and I, <laughs> it seemed like uh, in court it worked a little better. But Mark, I want to uh, kind of follow up on a point you're talking about. I hope this is uh, responsive, you know. We're talking about the professional rules of conduct. And the one is, you know, the communication with your client. And the, the lawyer shall explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. You know, the whole idea of meeting with your client in advance and explaining what the, the opponent's brief means, why they said it, what the significance is, what impact it has on the case. You know, you're, you're, you are allowing your client to make informed decisions, which is what you're supposed to do. It is the client's case. Mm -hmm. But by the same token, you're also building trust, having the client trust you. You're, 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 you're building confidence in, in you. And uh, so when it comes time at the mediation to 
have the client perhaps accept some of your suggestions, it's not going to meet with such a fear or resistance initially. If you've actually worked with your client, you've got to know them. I mean, there are, there are plenty of good lawyers, and I emphasize good lawyers. Good lawyers, they'll go to the client's house and go through interrogatories, get the answers to the interrogatories, see what their life is like so you know them, so that when you go to mediation, you're just not babbling off uh, jury instructions or something. You're really truthfully explaining the depth of the seriousness of the case, the intricacies of the case. It's, it's real important to spend time with your client. Yeah, I think if, if you don't, you really are doing a disservice to the client because the client is there to discuss the case, to see about settling. And if you've not had that discussion with your client, they're going to be totally scared and confused if you come in as the attorney and say, well, maybe we ought to consider, you know, this alternative resolution. And I think you're right, Judge Beeman, that it, it really increases the trust uh, you build that rapport with your client, and then the client is more inclined to listen to your advice. And, and on that front, uh, thinking about my class with Davis, and this is based upon what we actually did at my companies, um, regardless of the time of, type of dispute it was, there was a discipline process, look at it carefully and figure out what category it fits into. Is it a strong case, meaning our position is really strong. Is it a weak case? Is it something in the gray zone? And at least my mantra was, if it's a strong case, let's go show the other side why it's a strong case and, and get rid of it. If it's a weak case, we're in trouble. Well, we should get rid of it now because it's not going to get better later. I don't care how many good lawyers we have. Um, and then if it's in the gray zone, let's go figure out why it's gray. What do they see differently than, than we do? Um, and my advice for all of my students, and we went through this exercise at the beginning of a dispute, start the conversation with your client about this ADR process. You may not use it, you may use it later versus now, but the tough situations, um, and I get them periodically, are the cases where it's six weeks before trial, the litigation's been going on for a couple of years and you're raising issues about alternatives and what we could do other than what a court's gonna order or not order. And sometimes there's a difficult dynamic between lawyer and client about, well, this was a good idea, why didn't we do it two years ago? Um, or you know, the other unfortunate situation I think we all run into is you're so far along in the case, the investment in terms of not just money, but time has been so huge that it's disproportionate to the likely result of trial. And those sunk costs make for a very difficult dynamic um, about how do you justify the result when you've invested, again, monetarily, um, time, everything other disruption <clears throat> that much all the more reason to make sure the client understands there's multiple paths to get to where we want to get to as early as possible in, in the process. And by describing it pre-mediation, you have the opportunity to start making sure they understand it's not like the TV movies about disputes. It's not Judge Judy. And by the way, when we're there, I'm not going to yell at the other side, even though I think they're a jerk. Um, I'm going to talk civilly about alternatives and options and obviously the strength of our position too. So when you see me do that, don't get upset that I'm not yelling at them. Right. Uh, I mean, that goes back to your, the TV analogy. I can't remember which, which one of you raised that. Clients just like normal people, they're, I mean, they're normal people who we're all shaped by these images we get of what our process is like, which sometimes is not what our process is like. You know, I just wanted to jump in and let you know we have 15 minutes remaining if you'd like to answer any questions that have been submitted. Uh, great, great. Thank you, Katie, thank for that. Um, yes, um, if you don't mind, if, that, if that's all right, Judge Willer and Judge Beeman. Sure. Um, so I, there are a number of things I've been, I've been looking at. Um, one of them is some great comments. Uh, apparently, somebody looked up Christopher Hook's status with the state bar and there's it appears he's not been censured as yet. I don't know what's happened there. 
Um, it could be there may be a diversion program in place. I, I can't comment on that. Um, let me go, uh, Kathleen Lucas raised a very interesting question. Um, in mediations and arbitrations, when people are unnecessarily delaying the case, misrepresenting the facts or insulting counsel, are there remedies beyond a reprimand at the time? Referrals to the bar, et, et, et cetera. So what, do you, what, what input can you provide to the uh, lawyers who are asking the question, what do you do when there's, um, again, not just misrepresenting, I guess, misrepresenting the facts, unnecessary delay, or insulting counsel, recognizing the two of you are no longer in your judge role, what kind of advice would you provide? Judge Willard? Well, if, if it's a mediation, usually I find a nice, quiet place to take counsel and we have a discussion. You know, fortunately that hasn't happened very often. If it's an arbitration, um, pretty much you've got to stop it right there in front of everybody and, you know, where everybody can, can uh, hear and see what's happening and address the issue. You can't just let it go. I agree, but in mediation, obviously the big hamstring is, is confidentiality. So if somebody does something massively outrageous, I can't pick up the phone and call the state bar. I mean, your, your confidentiality means just that. You can't, you, I'm not gonna go outside the process and uh, seek help from the state bar. You have to deal with it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You can issue an order to show cause in arbitration and just deal with it straight up as you would in the court. I, I had that occur recently. Um, that's about the best I could do. So I, I would, that's great input. Uh, I think Kathleen's question, she's raised, I would say three different contexts when you feel like the people are unnecessarily delaying the case is one, misrepresenting the facts is another, insulting counsel is another. I think we talked a lot about the insulting counsel part and just, you know, I politely say, you're not, you're not helping yourself. First of all, you're not helping yourself with me. More importantly, you're not helping yourself with the other side by the insulting behavior. And, you know, you don't, you hopefully avoid those conversations when you need to have them. You just say, this is not moving the ball forward. And as somebody who sits also as a arbitrator and a judge pro tem, I can tell you it never helps anybody's position of the insulting behavior. If they're unnecessary delaying the case, I think that there's ways we can always talk about this delay is not necessarily helping anybody. And I will talk to people about the economic consequence to them uh, of that. And if it's a misrepresenting the facts thing, this relates to another question here. If they're, if they're misrepresenting the facts to you, I, I uh, politely say, I can't go there with you. If, you. if that's where you're sticking on this stuff, we either have to wrap it up or we have to find a different path, but I can't endorse something that you're telling me is not true to be true. That's, uh, you know, that, that, that's not something we can do. Let me jump to the next question because it kind of relates to that a little bit. And this is from Mark Rudy. Uh, it says, in a pre-litigation matter, the defense instructs the mediator to not advise plaintiff that there is insurance coverage for the matter. How do you handle this issue? Hmm. Well, you can ask what discovery has been done in so far as insurance is concerned. You're not advising them anything. You're just kind of uh, looking to see what they may already know. And if they have half a wit, uh, they're going to figure out they didn't look into it and start looking into it. But perhaps at that point, you're indirectly doing that which you were directly prohibited from doing. So it's kind of a delicate dance. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that that would be a hidden issue. I, isn't that something that typically you figure it out up front? It, it really affects your case. Or in some jurisdictions, it's a mandatory disclosure up front. Um, uh, so I ran into one situation, I can't describe details, but it had to do with uh, the context was what, whether the insurance coverage was possibly X or 2X. And one side was adamant they didn't want to disclose that it was 2X. And I had this, my way of addressing that is to say, if this case doesn't settle, the other side's going to learn it's 2X. 
you may want to argue, and they could argue in this that situation, that it was only one X for their interpretation. Fair game. But this is going to come up, in, in if we don't settle the case, uh, and, in, and in turn, the, they saw the reasonableness of the suggestion and disclosed it was 2X. But their argument was only 1X, and that was fine, and we settled the case. Yeah, I mean, just think of it. There's excess coverage out there. Uh, you don't have them participate in the litigation. The case doesn't settle. They go to trial. They get a big verdict. Well, the excess carrier, they're not going to be on the hook. What, what do you think you were doing? Right, right. Yeah, I, um, I, th I think, again, falls into that category. If, if counsel are asking, they're telling you these are the facts, but they're insisting that the facts not be described. You have to, my, my view is that we have to decide whether we go forward today or take this conversation in a different path. But we can't... Um, kind of enable that kind of, uh, kind of misrepresentation about what's going on. I think, frankly, another benefit of the pre-calls is it also allows us to ask questions about coverage, which helps everybody um, in terms of getting something done. I deal with a lot of unusual cases where there's coverage where people don't, aren't necessarily aware that there is coverage. Um, and using, using the pre-call is also an opportunity to ask what you know what is out there and sometimes the insured hasn't bothered to check to see oh actually there is additional coverage they weren't thinking about um so um, it's just it's in that category of the more we can help prepare to help them everybody is is better off from that um Mark, so look, go ahead i'm gonna I'm sorry to interrupt you there but i thought of this a while ago this isn't every case, it's perhaps the exceptional case, but people need to think in mind, keep in mind too, you know, there are occasions where you want to have two sessions. And if you wait until like the week before trial, and then you decide to go ahead and have your first mediation, well, you've deprived yourself of the opportunity for a second bite. That, 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 no, that's a great input. And, um, and I'll also say, because I do a lot of early stage cases, I think there's a misconception that this process is you have one session and it either settles or it doesn't. If it doesn't, it's a failure, as opposed to there are some cases where people haven't done all the work they need to do. You don't need to do a lot of work, but there's some step that hasn't been done that is important. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong um, uh, or an indication of failure to say, you know, we need to get that one answer and then we come back. And had a lot. I've had a lot of success where people realize, let's figure, let's focus on one issue, not twenty issues. One issue that's really going to make a difference. And then we focus that, focus that issue. They go do that homework, and then you come back. So the mindset of it's one and done, and if it's not done, it's a failure. Please throw that away. There's sometimes it needs, it needs a little more work. Um, let me throw out a couple more questions with our time. Um, one question for Roger Lewis, are you suggesting pre-mediation conferences with each side separately? Yes. Yes. Definitely yes. Definitely yes. The joint calls can be very helpful. Um, and if anybody ever wants to do them, great. But um, obviously you get more candor out of having some separate conversations. And like I said, touch on sometimes some sensitive back issues that really help us understand how to help everybody. Um, next question, any suggestions for clients with personality disorders involving lying once you learn about the characteristic? <laughs> Suggestion, huh? <laughs> um, well, you might, you might tell them that, you know, these jury trials that we're supposed to be conducting, they're supposed to be a pursuit of the truth. And that might give them the hives. I don't know what, but you know, uh, a falsehood or a misrepresentation of the truth will be revealed in front of the trier of fact, be a jury or judge, and you know that's not going to help you win. I guess it comes under the heading of client preparation. You know, you just can't let them lie. Uh, it, that's not going to resolve the case. Yeah. Um... 
Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. It just, the more we can, the, the more clients or lawyers can engage us to say, here's one of the things I'm dealing with. You know, my, my description of our job a lot, a lot of times is we're doing our job well, we're lifesavers. We're trying to save everybody as opposed to shine a light on a particular problem or say you really screwed something up. It's like, we need to get everybody out from under this process. Um, so yeah, reach out if you're dealing with some issues. And I've had that happen many times where people will say, here's what's going on behind the curtain. And we come up with a plan. Um, and that's the benefit of reaching out early. It gives us all some time to think and, and get back to you. Um, let's see, we've got a few more minutes here and some great questions. Um, here's one from Malcolm Scher. If the mediator knows of a case that is pertinent, it may even be dispositive on a motion for summary judgment, but the case has not been cited by either side, should the mediator ethically notify both sides of the case? Uh, depends. <laughs> uh, I think you can have a discussion about the law that they're aware of. And you can also ask the question, you know, is there any additional authority? What have you done to check for additional authority? How are you so sure that your position's accurate? Uh, if, and then uh, you can ask them, well, would you like me to do some research uh, and maybe come up with a point? You, that'd be my approach. Yeah, you, you can't take a, you know, a position that in favor of one side versus the other side. I would be very worried about that. But at the same time, if this is indeed a dispositive case, people, they should be aware of it. And, and I like Judge Beeman's uh, idea about how to, to raise it. Okay, that's great. Um, so let me, let me get a few more with our remaining time. Um, this was a little bit longer. Here's a, here's a comment question. I've utilized CCP 128.7 safe harbor provision by giving notice to opposing counsel regarding egregious conduct. Typically this backfires and our relation becomes even more contentious, causing more delays and needless meet and confers for basic discovery. Judge Beeman and Judge Willard, can you describe some conduct which you have seen justifying sanctions under CCP 128.7, do you believe that it really is a deterrent? Judge Willard, I'll listen to you. <laughs> I'm going to listen to you, Judge Beeman. I'm, I'm more familiar with the, the sanctions of family law, where if you're not promoting settlement and you're being obstress, obstreperous, you've got your 271s, which can, can be a really, really good hammer. I'm, I'm more familiar with, with the sanctions and directly with family law? Well, uh, there was a time when I was on the bench that looking back on it, perhaps I uh, was a little heavy handed in issuing sanctions. But insofar as what I would say is you're looking for a, a clear violation of the procedure. You're looking for intentional misconduct. Uh, and uh, you know, it comes in, in, in varying degrees. Uh, some of them can be uh, one I can think of right off the top of my head where uh, a large corporation failed to produce a, a category of discovery in violation of three separate discovery orders. Well, the sanction uh, order in that case was uh, very significant, you know, but I, I hope that's responsive to the question. Uh, I mean, it's, a judge, I think, I think really likes to not impose sanctions, to tell people how much you don't want to impose sanctions. And, but if, you, if this continues, this is what's gonna happen. And then if it does, then you have to lower the boom. That's great. So we only, I think we have about three minutes left. I'd like to just ask Judge Beeman and Judge Willard, any, any um, concluding comments or any um, things we didn't get to? We have more things on our outline, but. Well, you said, is there anything you didn't get to? You raised the area of brain science and you remember I said, there's a whole library full of stuff there. So we didn't get to that. Uh, 
I, I read this one time and, I, and this is somebody else's idea, okay, not mine. But you know, what we're involved in is we're making decisions based on beliefs concerning the likelihood of uncertain events. Decisions based on beliefs concerning the likelihood of uncertain events. Well, the question becomes what determines such beliefs? And that's where brain science goes. Uh, you're looking at the subjective assessment of probability, emphasis on subjective. So I hope that sparks your interest. You go to the library and spend some time with it. Right. Judge Willard? Well, I, I think that I do hope that the uh, attendees take a, a good look at the resources that have been put together for this program. I think that they are very, very helpful. And, um, you know, there's really not much more I can uh, add to that. So if I, I might just do, I want to reinforce one point, which is to the extent you encounter uncivil behavior, we've all done it. Uh, we've all, I had temperamental moments. I certainly did during my litigation days. So it's, we're not, people are not above it. But even when you are encountering uncivil behavior on the other side, don't give up on the idea of trying to get your case resolved. Bring in a neutral um, who is a leveling force and you will not see the bad behavior that you're afraid of or your client's afraid of most of the time. Um, a good neutral controls the rub. That's number one. Um, the other one I always advocate and I required when I during my general counsel days, when I couldn't go to mediations, I, I couldn't go to most of them, but I had a rule with my team members, which is before you go to the mediation, you reach out not once, not twice, three conversations with the other side to talk about the case. I don't mean scheduling depositions and procedural stuff. Try to figure out what they see differently. Tell them what you see differently. Don't worry about having your pocket picked. You won't, you're smart. But ask, try to learn as much as possible what their, why, their, why their perceptions are different than ours. We may have missed something once in a while we had, but as much, you will find, you'll clear a lot of the, the fog out of the room before you show up. You will probably make a human connection, even if they may have some rough edges, you will make more of a human connection, which will make the dialogue more useful. And as somebody who, you know, who does a lot of mediation work, where people sometimes show up and say, and I'll say, what conversations have you had before today? They'll say none. Uh, Start the process. You will help us help you when we all get together. You will help yourself be more productive during that day. So pick up that phone. Yeah, even if you catch them in a bad moment, just write it off to a bad moment. They didn't have the coffee they should have had. Just engage and good things typically flow from that. So Katie, I think we have used up our two hours. Yes, we have. Thank you very, very, very much panel. And thank you everybody who uh, contributed to this discussion. Mm -hmm.